today being the 22nd anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, I would ask that we observe a moment of silence. First item on the agenda, item 1.03, approval or revision of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you, Cindy, and a second from Sherry. Any discussion? We are anticipating our student board member coming tonight to do her oath, but if she doesn't, we'll have to table that when we get to it. So that may be something that comes up later on. All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstained. Oh, well, it's right there, actually. <laughs> I thought it was a little further down. Uh, I have not heard from her. Um, why don't we <coughs> move that then? Um, 1.04. Let's move that to yes, to make that 6.03. So um, I need a motion to move item 1.04 to make the item 6.03. Thank you, Gerald. Second from Rebecca. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstained. Next on the agenda, <coughs> excuse me, item 2.01, presentation for the spring 23 student climate survey results. Dr. Tice. As uh, the board knows, we enlisted the help of research and marketing strategies, a private uh, third party vendor to help uh, administer a anonymous and confidential uh, survey. Uh, we applaud their efforts. Uh, it certainly has been a pleasure to work with them. They've kept everything confidential. I know the board and the community relations committee and the administration and actually the teachers uh, during opening uh, day uh, had a chance to work with the results and now RMS uh, representatives are here to present. So Pat, we'll turn it over to you. Great, well uh, thank you so much Dr. Tice, I really appreciate you uh, making some time for us to speak and, and share some of the findings today. I know you probably have a, a full agenda, first week of school, a lot of things going on. So I appreciate the time to, to share what we found and I, uh, uh, I echo Dr. Tice's comments. It was really a pleasure to work with your team. Everybody was great. Uh, working on this project um, in terms of administration, getting out to the students. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, we had to work through in terms of making sure we could get through their servers and we weren't uh, going into the right uh, junk mail or anything like that. And it all went great. And I think the results uh, and response rate that we had to is kind of reflective of that. Uh, so what I'll do here today is I'll do some quick introductions of uh, myself and my colleague Molly, who's joined me tonight, talk a little bit about RMS. I'll share the results at a high level of uh, the report. And uh, please, uh, we're gonna go through kind of at the highest level here. And if you have specific questions for me, uh, we'll have a question and answer tonight. Uh, and also, you know, have seen the report too as well, so you can dive in a little bit deeper there as well too. And also spend some time talking about some recommendations and findings and uh, how to move forward uh, with what we found. Uh, so as Dr. Tice said, I'm Pat Fiorenza. I'm the Director of Research Analytics at uh, Research and Marketing Strategies. Uh, we're a local full service uh, research firm located in Baldwinsville. Uh, we were established in 2002 by Mark Dangler, who unfortunately can't be here tonight. We are uh, actually run the CNY Best Places to Work um, survey, uh, and that event is tonight. Where we're announcing the winners of there too, so he's uh, off presenting here, and Molly and I uh, are holding down the fort here tonight too. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, RMS has a lot of experience in the education industry. Uh, we work with a lot of local school districts. We've done stuff with Baldwinsville, West Jenny, uh, Oneida, and so we are familiar with the space. Uh, which was nice kind of working with Dr. Tice and his team where we could kind of lean on that experience as we worked on, on this project. Uh, what's fun about my job is we work across all industries and all sectors. So it's fun to really you know, look at a project and start making connections between you know, what did we learn from this last banking survey and apply it into education uh, that kind of manifests in some of our reputation about high survey response rates. Uh, it's one of the ways that we're known for that we can get people to take surveys, which you say the word survey, I know a lot of people just want to run away as fast as they can or click close on their, on their emails, I encourage you, please don't do that. You can make my job a lot a lot easier too, but we're, we've done away with good 
good job of building relationships with people so they take that action to participate. Uh, and we're also really passionate about being our, our clients, their back office. Uh, so we want to be more than just uh, kind of, uh, we don't, more than just our client. We really want to be our partners in this work and collaborate and really make sure that the results that we're finding will help drive your organization forward or really shed light on how you can improve the experience uh, for the students within your district. And we operate with full transparency. I think that's something that's really important to us about uh, the data that we're collecting. Uh, you own the data, it's your information. And we want to make sure that we're completely transparent with what's being collected and how things are, are running. Uh, and the last bullet here is just about our privacy and security. Uh, we work a lot with the Center, uh, Center for Medicaid Services, our approved research vendor in NYSERDA, uh, New York State's Energy uh, Department too, which basically means we're at the highest level of uh, security and protections on how we protect our data, uh, both on our server and the cloud and all those technical areas to really make sure that what we have is safe and secure. I can kind of trust the information that we're that we're collecting. Uh, in terms of your report, uh, this first slide just at the highest level about the results. Uh, so this student climate survey, we modeled it after a national survey, uh, and that survey has been uh, validated uh, for both uh, reliability and um, uh, validity. So what that means is we have confidence that that survey being implemented, if it was implemented in different settings or multiple times, the results will be um, uh, answered the same way or appropriately on there too. So the tool itself was statistically valid uh, that we used. And what was also great about this survey too is we had an 88% response rate, which is really terrific uh, in terms of response from the students and a very low margin of error, uh, error, error. So that means basically we can trust these results going forward and that we know that the information is valid and reliable too. And uh, if we do this work again, we have some really nice benchmarks to compare against uh, in this work. So at the highest level, the four uh, key themes that we identified is generally that students are satisfied with the culture at Fayetteville Manley School District. However, we did find that there are some opportunities within the environment domain. We'll explain what that means uh, throughout this presentation. And we did see that stress is a negative factor, uh, and this was true particularly among female students. And when I thought about this, it was interesting. We gave this report. Uh, to Dr. Tice uh, earlier this year and when I was kind of reviewing my notes, sometimes you see things or think about these things a little bit differently too. So the silver lining I think about this finding is of course you don't want you know, students to feel stressed or have this uh, be a, a negative experience for them, but they were very clearly able to define what the cause of the stress was and they had mentioned that you know the, the strong ac academic reputation you have and the status in the community and they want to live up to that obligation which is really kind of the, the, the fact that they can name that, they can say that's what the issue is, I think is actually a positive. So as administrators and teachers, it's helping them understand how to manage those emotions so the stress doesn't become a barrier to their you know, excelling and they can kind of use that, maybe turn that stress into motivation or, or more positive framing of that, that feeling of wanting to excel, which I think is something that, that you would want students, students to have. So there's a little bit of a silver lining in there too. On the, on the stress finding that we found. Uh, we also looked at this among different uh, subgroups too, either socioeconomic status or special education status, and we did not find any variation in the data. People, uh, the students were responding similarly across all those, all those groups. And we did find in some uh, cases that uh, students' respect for each other was low, and this is just an opportunity, I think, to think about how to really encourage students, of, again, about treating others with kindness and respect both in and out of the classroom. And a lot of this came out also in the open-ended questions that we asked. And so some of it was uh, experiences, you know, in the restrooms or in the hallways or uh, on the bus. So kind of times when, you know, uh, teachers' eyes might not be direct, directly on them. So these were more of the cases where we saw some of this coming, coming into play. So the way the survey was structured, uh, th there was three key domains, and in the report, uh, we define each of these a little bit more in depth. But it, the, really, the three big ones were engagement, safety, and environment. And within each of these domains, uh, they break it down, uh, the federal government, into different subgroups. Uh, so cultural linguistic competence. So this is more their awareness of their culture and understanding about the community and how they relate to that. Uh, relationships, so their strength of relationships with uh, uh, other students and administrators, and their participation in, in school events. Um, so maybe this is being part of uh, certain clubs or athletic groups. 
uh, safety. Uh, so this breaks out into several domains around emotional safety, physical safety, uh, bullying and cyberbullying, and substance um, abuse. Uh, so this was again about how safe they feel uh, coming to school uh, and being an active member or a student within uh, the schools that we, we looked at. And then environment. Uh, so this looks at uh, more of infrastructure uh, in one area and then also things like discipline and mental health. Uh, so this is the way that the, uh, the survey was structured uh, that, we, that we administered. And this was done for students uh, from fifth grade up uh, to as well. So again, you might say fifth grade sounds kind of young for a, a survey, uh, but again, the survey has been, it was tested and uh, we felt confidence that it was an appropriate uh, tool to use for, uh, for that age. So the results here to go through. Uh, so what we found again is that the uh, environment category was a little bit lower and for the mean scores uh, that we calculated, we considered anything above uh, a three to be favorable. And so you were close, you're really close on the safety and environment ones there too. So uh, hopefully if this is done again, those numbers can kind of see those creep up and see some improvements on there too. Uh, so across each of the, the uh, schools that we looked at, uh, pretty similar, uh, the middle schools uh, seemed to fare just a little bit better than, uh, than the high schools uh, did as well. And so this is a question that we asked about uh, in, the, in the past 12 months, how often have you felt? Uh, and then this gives us a list of items on there too. This is called the Cohen's Perceived uh, Stress Scale. And so this is measured on a scale, I believe it goes up to 40, and it gives different levels of stress that students uh, feel from low, uh, moderate to uh, extreme. And you are in the moderate level of stress based on the scale, and with 11th graders feeling the most amount of stress and the 12th graders feeling uh, the least amount of stress. Uh, and so this was just provide just to students uh, grades nine through 12. And again, we saw that uh, females felt a little bit higher stress than compared to the male students. Um, and so kind of on this, some of these items to highlight, uh, what you can see is so 59% of students said that they felt uh, behind on things in the, la in the last 12 months. Uh, 58 said they felt stressed or nervous in the last 12 months. And you can kind of just follow that pattern uh, going, down, going down the list here too. So again, we mentioned as we started about how there was some stress uh, that students felt, and these are some of the ways um, more contextualized how what they felt uh, is going on in their in their day to day life, and some areas where we can think about uh, maybe how to support them a bit more. And so then we asked another question, a little bit more on uh, stress. So we gave a list of items again about different areas, and we asked, is it causing uh, to what degree is it causing? causing you stress and what I did on this scale is I just I condensed it just to those responses that said a lot of stress or overwhelming stress they also could have uh, chose on the opposite end or uh, no stress or very little stress too so these are basically what you see is 55 percent are saying that grades are, are a source of their stress uh, and then my own expectations uh, 48 percent or homework 44 percent uh, so again this gives some idea about where the stress is coming from from students and it connects into some of the, the open-ended questions that we asked too as well at the end um, you know students could either say tell us more about you know anything that you would like to say in the survey or we also asked what did you like and what did you dislike and that uh, is highlighted in the report uh, as well and it kind of aligns with what what we saw here in the quantitative data too so it's nice to see that both the, the qualitative data through the open-ended questions and the quantitative data here kind of aligns too that you know, they're feeling stressed about meeting expectations and uh, the grades uh, there too as well. So this next slide, we also asked about if they had a trusted adult that they felt that they could uh, go to, both if they were struggling academically or if they felt like they were struggling emotionally. Uh, and so this is, again, one of those that's kind of, it's a little bit of a mix, I think. You know, obviously, as, as members of the board, you're, you're passionate and you want to say everybody you know, has that you know, person that they can go to. So on one hand, I think you know, at the high school level, 68% say they do have someone they can go to academically. But then again, about a third of students don't have that, uh, don't have that person they feel like they can go to. So I think this is one area you can think about. You know, how, are we, how are you building relationships with them? Make sure they have uh, you know, someone that they can go to. 
and that the students are aware of all the tools and supports that they can get if they're feeling like they're struggling academically and the same thing emotionally too. So they know that they can go to somebody when they need help um, and, you know, before something becomes uh, a crisis. Uh, in terms of recommendations, uh, we highlight some of these in our report uh, a little bit further too, but the nine that I want to talk through today, uh, the first one is a uh, suggestion of convening a school-wide climate improvement team. And what I think this can do is it can help, you know, you have the report, you have the findings and the data. Uh, it can start to really start building some strategies off the findings too. And I think our role as an analyst is really to present the data and share our insights, but you really have all the context within the school. So you know the ins and outs, how things can work, what can be practical, and looking at the data saying, oh, this makes sense, but you know, I really wanna go a little bit deeper on why you know, we see some of these findings too and understand the context around it too as well. So I think convening some type of improvement team to really set up uh, strategies and work groups uh, and thinking about you know, both what can we improve and celebrating some of the things that you know you're doing, doing really well, it will be a great step forward for, for the district. Uh, number two is thinking about uh, looking at any early intervention practices that you have for at-risk students. Uh, so this is thinking about any community partnerships that you have, maybe it's uh, morning programs, after school programs, uh, programs coming into the classroom and making sure that students who you think are, are, might be at, rest, at risk are really accessing those programs and really leveraging them to the best of their ability. We know from the literature that these programs work and really getting people involved and connected. It can help in some of these domains, especially around engagement and some of the safety ones too as well. Uh, number three, I believe you're already, you're already kind of in the works and doing this and, and really why this uh, report was started and why we're working with you too is just always thinking about the shared vision for the district and strategic planning about how you can kind of coalesce the teams and around a shared mission and vision and everybody's on the same page moving towards those, those shared goals and objectives. Uh, number four, uh, uh, more ongoing uh, or continuing professional development for teachers. And I know some teachers might cringe here, more professional development. I know some days are, they're so busy, they can, I'm amazed that they can even get uh, to the restroom with how busy they are throughout the day. Uh, so making this really meaningful them, for them too as well and keeping them informed on the latest teaching strategies and, and whatever might be happening in the literature too as well. And I think another thing, I think one of the beautiful things about teaching is the more you do it, the better you get. So I think it's a good way to connect maybe some of teachers who have been around a little bit longer to, to share practices and maybe create some informal type of mentorships with younger uh, teachers too who are just entering uh, the profession and those first early years from what I've read in the literature and from uh, people going through it that I know, those are tough years to really start turning in you know, what you learn in the classroom into uh, what you learn as you're training to be a teacher and applying that into the, in the classroom. Uh, the next piece here is uh, making sure you kind of, uh, five and nine are very similar. Uh, it's just kind of closing the loop and surveying your staff to, to understand what the barriers might be around uh, maybe implementing some uh, changes that you might want to do to improve the school climate. And also hearing from them about what their challenges are, what the mor morale's like and what their needs are too. If there's maybe there's some low hanging fruit you can identify from uh, reaching out to them and giving them a space to really talk about what their issues are. Uh, and working with a third party like RMS uh, gives some anonymity too so to them to feel like they can provide open and honest responses. Uh, we know the importance of relationships and school connectedness. So all the great activities that you do, I saw some kids running around on the athletic field when I got here, which is great. So all those things continue to do, do those as well. Uh, number seven is this idea of the whole child philosophy. So this is really thinking about how every part of you know, the, the way that you touch and work with children here is connected uh, and making sure you're rounding out the whole experience for them too. Um, and it's just amazing to me when I was thinking about these things about how much the world has changed from when I was in school. My daughter just started kindergarten last week and she was in UPK in the Baldwinsville district too. And over the summer one day, she was like, Daddy, I need to relax my body. I'm gonna go do some yoga. And I said, you can go do yoga? I was like, this is, never would even thought. When I was your age, not even a thing on my mind. So it's just great how these things are changing now too on there as well. Uh, and then number eight is just really working on uh, the stressors and uh, tools for students to help them deal and manage um, the stress that they might feel too. And again, so what they're feeling doesn't become an inhibitor to their success and they can use it in a more, a more positive way. Uh, so we go through these uh, throughout the report uh, and talk a little bit more about ways you can maybe implement them and, and how they could, they could work. 
so that was at a high level uh, of the report, uh, too, of what we found. And if anyone on the board has any questions or comments, I'd be happy to happy to address them. And if you get through them and you think, you know, after we leave here tonight, you think some more questions you want to ask or, or comments, please feel free, uh, free to reach out. We're happy to address and talk more. So, sure, Seth. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I know the national survey that you baselined against was from 2015 to 2017. Do you know, is there going to be a refreshed version of that just so we can see where we sit against national averages? Yeah, so we were, we were really frustrated by this too because we reached out to them and we asked, are you gonna be doing this again? When are the new benchmarks gonna be released? And they did not have an answer. What they did in 2015 to 2017, it sounded like a pilot study too, so the answer is we don't know, and we're really hoping that they could do it. And especially now in a post-COVID world, a lot has changed since then too. So when we talk about the benchmarks in the report, we kind of, uh, they were really measured about how much we really want to put stock into comparing them. Uh, the good news is that you have this report now for yourself, uh, but it would be great if we could identify. And one of the things maybe, you know, if we do this again, we can uh, look at maybe how some other districts have done this too and just say, Hey, let's all share our data and sort of really be beneficial to all of us. So, yeah. I think that it's really informative. Um, you just mentioned the pre and post COVID. Have you, you worked with districts that you did the surveys before and after and found differences or um, is that something you just started working with districts after COVID? Yeah, we have, uh, I started at RMS about two years ago. So I started, I had not been at the before, so I haven't really looked at looked at that data through that lens, but now that you mentioned that, that's something I'm gonna go go and do now and see what I can what I can dig up and find on there too. Some of the changes. I think with FM though we should really just base it on what we have, like not compare ourselves to others, but um, mm -hmm. it is an interesting idea to think about how yeah. it may have changed. Yeah, no absolutely and you know, it's always interesting when you're, you know, if you do look at it, you know, in 2017 or, or whenever, it's a conversation starter. So that's what I would recommend too. So when you're looking at the data um, and doing that kind of benchmarking, it's a good way to get people talking around it too. So um, I don't get lost in the data. Think more about the strategy connected to it. So. Hyper technical, sure. And my <laughs> college statistics professors will be very disappointed in me for not remembering <laughs> much of what we went through. Um, but for most of these, you have a mean score for Eagle Hill, mm -hmm. mean score for Wellwood, mean for the high school, and then a district mean. Mm -hmm. To arrive at the district mean, if I'm looking at this right, it's a third, a third, a third. You're, you're taking the three numbers and getting the mean out of those, which is, isn't that overweighting middle school compared to high school? That we did not calculate it that way. So it's the aggregate, if you're, if I'm understanding right, we're not taking the mean means of the means. So we're taking the aggregate numbers from the whole and then calculating for the overall. So I'm I looking, would not. I'm looking at a row just as an example. Yep. So engagement relationships, Eagle Hill 3.2, mm -hmm. Wellwood 3.1, high school 3.0, district mean 3.1, right. which would seem that it's taking the three and equally weighting the three schools. It, the, yes. So yes, they are. They would be equally weighted because we're taking from the full, the full sample. So we're not doing any weighting compared because the high school population is bigger than. No, so we did not weight it, weight it in that way. So, I mean, that's what I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out if it's, it, it just, the, the numbers as I ran through them, it appeared as though, just in the, yep. the more granular yep. report, that it's weighting it as essentially as two thirds, one third, and overweighting middle school to get the district mean. I just want to make sure if that's what's happening here or not. Yes. So that would be that. Yes, but statistically, I, for what we calculate for the overall, I think that's that's an appropriate appropriate way to to calculate that the district mean. 
And the other reason is because of the, the size of the sample, too, because we're looking at the district, the full, the full district as a whole. So, and that's why we break down by the, by the groups, too. Okay, I'm just, I, I guess I'm just a little bit, I, I wanna make sure we're working on the right baseline. Okay. And on many of these items, the high school scoring was slightly lower than the middle schools. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I just, I wanna, I, part of me wonders if we aggregated the middle schools and the high school and then equally weighted those, if that's a more accurate reflection. Are you talking about the overall yes. mean? Yes. Okay, I can uh, run it by Mark and see if he, if he thinks a different, a different weighting, if there's a weighting needed for the overall, for the overall district. Okay. All right, I, I, that's why I'm just, I'm yep. just a little bit, I, I, yep, I, I want to make sure we're looking at the, the right accurate baseline, baseline mm -hmm. as we go forward yep. with it. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. I, thank you so much for this presentation. Yep. It was really informative and I'm just kind of digesting the, the full report, which is yep. almost 70 pages, but yes. I think we have a lot of work to do on our end to now break down the data and figure out as a, as a district and I think community relations was gonna start by really our, our board committee to, to figure out what to, you know, what to look at and do next. Um, from your perspective, I'm interested, we've talked about administering these surveys next year, certainly to staff, certainly K to four, mm -hmm. and possibly to the whole student body again. And I'm wondering if it would look like the same survey or if we might dig deeper into the, some of the topics that were of more concern and, and tailor a survey that gives us even more information um, to areas where we, ha we can really improve. Yeah, I think you could, that's a conversation, you could do it either, either way. Uh, so the, the student, there are versions of the parent student uh, survey too at the federal level that are again, validated tools that you can use. And what we did in this survey is we did add in a couple questions too about the, the stress questions were what we put in there too. Um, so as you get into the data and if you wanna really go into like that environment domain and say we really wanna understand this, this area more, those are things we could certainly um, look at and add into the survey too. And if you look at the survey and say, oh, this survey is feeling like it's uh, getting, you know, it's, it's getting too big, we don't wanna do all this too, there's other, data strategies we could talk about doing too, if it's a focus group with uh, parents or uh, with teachers, other ways to collect the data too. So sometimes it's figuring out the questions you wanna ask and then connecting it to the right, the right mode of research, research too. But the good news is there are surveys already available for you know, the parents and uh, teachers too, which are very similar to, to the one we administered. And later on in the agenda, I will be asking the board to approve going forward for this current year to administer a student survey in the autumn, in the spring, along with a faculty staff survey in the autumn and a family survey in the spring. Uh, that could be streamlined as we go forward, depending if we're seeing similar scores or a difference between autumn and the spring, at least by doing it one more time in the spring, it wasn't necessarily optimal for students or any of us uh, doing it when we did it in the middle of, you know, the testing and end of the year. So we'll be able to compare kind of pre and post just to see what we have. But maybe in the future it could be streamlined. So the other question I had was, obviously we're gonna benefit from doing this and then redoing it because benchmarking against yourself is the easiest. I, you had on, in the, the detailed report a series of, I don't know, it was eight or nine other school districts mm -hmm. around the nation. Um, I, I, can you just speak to how and why those were picked? They were picked, we were looking for uh, similar districts and some ones that we could find that had publicly available data and those were the ones that we could identify and, and get that we could we could find in terms of um, available data for us for the benchmarking. And again, uh, those were not as available as we had hoped, um, but that's what we could we could find and, and start to compare uh, or try to compare compare with. So, and I think going forward, you're right. If we can find more data, that's great. But we'll have the benchmarks for for FM to look at uh, that way. 
Okay, thank you. I was just like, like the one right below FM was listed as California Department of Education. Yeah. I, I can't see where that's comparable to FM, so that's why. So okay. this, is, these are, this is what yeah. you were able to find. Yeah. Not, okay, yeah. not picking them out as we think this is comparable that we should benchmark able, against. Able to find, yeah. So. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, so Dr. Tice, you've sh shared this data with your administrative leaders, correct? And have, did they have a look at all these recommendations as well? And are they thinking about this in their building action plans or? That's that part of the year going forward. They had a chance to uh, first dibs at it and then thanks to Dr. Doughton and part of the schedule for opening day, the teachers had a series of questions to kind of work through it and departments and grade levels to take a look at what do we got. Yeah, we wanted the staff to have first dibs before we did the public presentation. I don't think there are any other questions. Thank you very much. We appreciate the work. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Molly, anything? You just <laughs> I'm an old ticker. Thank you, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Okay. Moving to item 2.02, .02, athletics program presentation. We're delighted to have our athletic director here. I know the board has been interested in this topic and I appreciate Scott taking time out of a busy fall sports schedule to be here with us and put the slideshow together. So Mr. Sugar, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening, thank you for the invitation. Um, as mentioned, we're talking about athletic coaching. Uh, there's been some questions about uh, this topic in, uh, as a whole. And I think this is a good platform to provide you with some information about um, what goes into our seasonal and yearly um, responsibilities as coaches. So a little background about our teams. We have 88 teams in the district, 121 coaching positions. I broke those down by, by uh, month or by season. So there's 48 in the fall. Um, we're ranging from middle school or modified level up to the varsity level. Uh, winter has 28, and then the spring has 45. And then just for some participation numbers for, for, for context, there's 706 athletes in the fall last year. Um, figured I'd run the student-to-coach or student to coach ratio, so you see 15 to 1, which is pretty good in the fall, 16 to 1 with 443 participants in the winter, and then another 664 um, with a 15 to 1 ratio. Overall, 1,813 student athletes. Obviously, some of those are multiple sport athletes. Those are not counted individually, so you could have a fall athlete and then a winter athlete. And then obviously, some of our middle school kids have the opportunity to play four times a year, which is a great opportunity. So um, we, we really have a large number of student athletes that are taking part in our program. A little bit about the, the department. Um, many of you sitting here know this. The community I hopefully knows that hopefully knows this but just to re rehash um, in 2021-22 we were named New York State Public High School Athletic Association School of Distinction which is given to all st all schools who have hundred percent of their varsity teams earning scholar athlete awards so their their overall GPA of 75 percent of their student athletes on their varsity roster have a GPA of 90 or above every um, team did in 2021-22. The three years, 19, uh, 18, 19, 2021, and 22-23, we were named School of Excellence. Those are given to the same uh, criteria, but you are 75% or higher of your varsity teams received Scholar Athlete Awards. I am, uh, um, I need to recognize that we were actually 29 out of, or 28 out of 29. We had one team all three years not earn Scholar Athlete Awards. Um, and then 2020, 2021, and 21, 22, we were named all CNY Overall Athletic Program of the Year. So it's, there's m multiple reasons why that is uh, distinguished, but we're very thankful for those awards. So a little bit about coaching positions. In New York State, coaching positions are one-year appointments. Um, so this is not a, an FM thing, this is, this is New York State. 
Um, they're one-year positions, so if somebody thinks that they have a 10-year term, that is not true. Um, all coaches, once appointed, they, they attend preseason meetings with me, the entire staff, and we go through a whole agenda or a whole array of responsibilities and duties and expectations for the year. Um, and then at the end of the year, we have end-of-season meetings for all coaches. All varsity coaches have in-person meetings with me and we do an evaluation. Now that's a link. Um, if I pull this up right now, you're probably not gonna be able to read it and the people in, this, in, the, in the crowd won't be able to read it, but um, I'd be glad to pull it up if you'd like to see it. But it is, a, uh, it is an, an evaluation, a written evaluation that goes through. Um, many of those things are never surprises. Um, I, I talk with almost all of my coaches in a season every day. So an evaluation doesn't happen at the end of the year at a one-time event. Um, and to think that I talk to every one of my coaches in that season every day, it, it doesn't happen once. We communicate um, multiple times daily throughout the entire year. So when questions might come to the board or to Dr. Tice, I guarantee you I already know. It's not a surprise. Um, so then at that uh, meeting, some of those meetings have taken hours, one, two, three hours. Um, I remember back probably about eight years, I had postseason meetings with one coach. We met three times, two, two hours apiece. And during those, we do, we do a season review. Um, and then depending on what the decision is going to be about a recommendation for the next year, uh, we would go through... Uh, a, whether the coach is going to be returning, if there's going to be a coaching change, and then if there's going to be a development of an improvement plan, just like a teacher. And then many times we have done that, uh, where we, we develop a very detailed improvement plan about what our expectations are. Um, I would even tell you that recently I had a meeting with uh, three coaches, and I was planning on developing a, an improvement plan. And unbeknownst to me, they actually came to the meeting with an improvement plan of themselves. So, which was, which was great because, A, it was a lot less work for me, and it allowed me to go through, they did a self-evaluation basically, and they developed a plan of how they were gonna move forward. And then we obviously talk about, as we said, areas of you know, needing improvement. Even our best coaches need some areas of improvement, and we always continue to work on those each and every day. And then we develop plan, our goals and, and plans and expectations for the following year if those coaches are gonna be moving forward. Uh, coaching positions are then posted at the end of each season. And at the least, we, we try to get our varsity coaches reappointed for the next year as soon as possible. And I'll show you why that is important uh, in an upcoming slide. But open positions um, are posted on local media outlets and then we use OLAS with our uh, HR department in, in searching out. I would tell you that um, for any people that might think that we have a lot of applicants, that is absolutely false. People do not want to coach. People do not want a referee. We had a varsity basketball position open for roughly four months about six years ago. I had to beg and plead college coaches in the area, do you have any graduates that you think might be capable of doing this? And unfortunately, we have more and more new hires that have not had any coaching experience at all. Okay? I was a varsity coach at age 22. It worked out, but it's not a good situation to put people in. Okay? Now, luckily, the person I'm referencing has been absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, but the trend nowadays in every single district in this country, it's harder and harder to find coaches. Um, I'm going to try to click on these and hopefully I don't get out of these. So many people ask me, you know, what do you need to do to be a coach? So if you're, if you're having trouble sleeping, you can go to the New York State Education Department's website. Um, this is the abbreviated version. Okay? But if you go to the ed, uh, State Ed Department, there is uh, a document, uh, 135.4. I believe it is, Dr. Tice, that outlines what the requirements are. This is the abbreviated version. I'm going to try to scroll through this. 
All our coaches go through the TEACH online certification process. They are fingerprinted before they're board approved. They apply for a certificate. Um, they pay $50 for that. It used to be, for a new coach, used to run about $350 for a new coach, new, a person, a non-teacher, to become certified. 350 bucks out the door. Um, I always kid, and I will continue to kid, if I wanted to hire Jim Beheim tomorrow, he would have to do all these requirements. And it would have cost him, back in the day, $350 to get certification. They have to get first aid and uh, CPR uh, certified. They will then go through a process of three required coaching classes, philosophy and principles, uh, and organization of athletics. That is um, required within the first three years. The next two, health and science, and theories and techniques of coaching are due in the first five years. The theories and techniques of coaching is, is required specific to the sport that they coach. So what that basically means is it entails some sort of internship uh, or actual coaching and um, going through some basically paperwork and, and, and stuff with the, with the class. Um, they can also, they can do either or. They can do the first three that I just named or they can go to number three, the NFHS uh, has an accredited online certification process which they can go through and that is done online. About five years ago this all changed and coaches never could do that. I actually teach the three classes abo above, the philosophy, the health science, and the theories and techniques. They used to be before we got to state ed and, and pleaded with them that this needed to be changed. Uh, we used to have to teach classes in person uh, I think they're 32 hour classes and they're very, very extensive, okay? Um, that has now changed with the online version which has become much more manageable for somebody to be able to, to uh, get that. They have to have s satisfactory coaching evaluations which we turn into BOCES. They complete all the trainings like a teacher does. Child abuse, save, DASA training, and then we said fingerprinting there. And then the second page of this is um, all the requirements for a coach if they're not a teacher. Okay? A teacher is required to have all these certifications or all these classes, all these trainings. They just don't have to apply for a certification. Okay? So quick example, our ice hockey coach works for Frito-Lay. If you ever need potato chips, let me know. Um, and he has all these requirements done. He applies for a certification every year. He's now on to his professional license, which is um, there towards the bottom, which is good for every three years. Um, and then every renewal, he renews that every three years. All right, let's see if I can go back. I'm not going to take you to this. Well, yeah, we'll go there. So this is the NFHS Learn. This is something that we helped uh, develop. I was on the committee that helped develop this. So now coaches can go in here, online training. They can click on their state, and it will walk them through the requirements that they can complete online. Um, and then they submit them to this. On top of that, actually, that's the next slide. I'll wait for that one. So then obviously the other requirements are sport rules. Rules change every single day, every single year. So they have to stay up on all their sport rules, district, district rules. Um, you've all seen this. This is an extracurricular duties expectation, which is, was developed with the help of um, Mr. Jeff Gordon a few years ago, and we have this for all our extracurricular activity expectations that, that they agree to before they sign their contract. And then they have to stay up on sectional rules and state rules. Many of those are like transfer rules, you know. So I am a, I'm usually the one that's uh, I am leading that charge because they will not always be up on what those changes are. So I'm leading what those might be. Additionally, there's there's continuing education. Um, we have first and foremost, coaches can go online 
to the NFHS Learn back here, and they can complete sports-specific training classes. So uh, in here, there's a pole vaulting class. So our pole vaulting coach has taken this class on his own, not required by me, not required by the district, not required by uh, state ed or anything, but he's taken that and he's completed it. There are some free classes like this one here. So name, Im image, and likeness. That's a new trend in college sports. It's actually legal for high school athletes. Our coaches could take this if we wanted to, or this could be a class that I do, I run with my coaches during one of their preseason meetings. Then these are a number of other things that, that go on. So USA Soccer uh, has their own certification process. Um, so if you wanted to coach in the World Cup, you have to have a certain level of training, certain level of certification. Some of our coaches, um, I won't name how many, but some of our coaches, not required by us, have done that training on their own, uh, which is outstanding. Ice hockey coaches, one of our, our, our head varsity ice hockey coach, is um, they have the same type of certification process. He has the highest level of certification, um, not required by us, but that's the training that he completed on his own. And then um, many, like, like many sports, uh, sports have um, conferences or conventions that, that some of our coaches have attended. I know our girls uh, lacrosse staff plans on attending the lacrosse convention um, this January in Philadelphia. Our boys staff usually goes every single year and our girls staff is going to go this year. And then something new that we're starting this year, uh, October 28th I'm running a um, coaching seminar for all our coaches and that's going to be run in conjunction with um, Paul Minch and Jeff Hammond and we have a number of different topics that we're going to cover uh, in a seminar just to continue to educate our coaches. So I wanted to use a little example of what, this is a varsity coach. And this is the coach that I referenced that I called Oswego State on and hired. This is what their season is. Season runs about November 15th to March 15th. That's what we pay them for. Then the spring, he runs an April break youth camp. Not required by us. He does it because he loves, his, loves the kids in our district and loves the sport. And then he runs spring open gyms two to three nights a week for two hours a night. It's free to our kids. We don't pay them. In the summer, the varsity team attends two varsity leagues. Basically, it's one night a week. Our JVs are in two leagues, ESM and Liverpool League. Our modifieds were even in the ESM league last year. They didn't have it this past summer. So two years ago, they ran a modified team. And they also have two uh, nights of open gyms each week. Again, all free to our kids and open to those interested in playing in the program. Coaches, again, not paid. The, team, the varsity team this summer, uh, well, and last summer, they, they attended two or three. This year it was two, last year it was three. Summer team camps, they go to Lemoyne and they go to uh, Oswego State. Uh, the Oswego State one was a Saturday, Sunday. And they played games all day long, working on things in the off season. They also ran two summer youth camps. They had a morning session for real young kids. Talk about fun. If you want to have some fun, let me know and I'll have you come coach with these kids. Talk about energy, wow. Um, and then the afternoon is our a little bit older kids, middle school kids, up to, I think it's 10th grade. And then the fall they have, actually this is wrong, I apologize. Uh, coach emailed me today, he requested three nights um, of open gym, not two. Uh, and we're going to try to give him as much as he would like. Um, and those run about an hour and a half to two hours. So that's just, that's just one example of a varsity coach of what they do. And I will tell you that every, I don't know of a varsity coach that doesn't run their program like that in some fashion. Uh, coaching responsibilities. So um, this is not club sports. We pride ourselves in educationally based athletics. Um, this is the development of the whole student. 
Um, this is, you know, we talk a lot about building relationships. It was good to hear the person before me speak about that, and we talk long and hard about um, why that is so important um, to help our student athletes. Um, this is an, an extension of the classroom, but it's also a privilege, not a right. Uh, chain of command, we talk about this, um, and we do pretty well here, but just to bring it back up, this is in our, uh, this is in our, all our district publications. So we encourage athlete to coach communication, and what I've actually done is I've, I've flipped this when I talk to my coaches. It's actually coach to athlete. So if you have a junior or senior that maybe aren't having, getting the playing time that they might want, we would love for the kid to come and say, hey, coach, you know, what can we do? What can, I, what can I get better at? But we know that that's hard for a 15, 16, 17-year-old to do. So we talk to the, or I talk to the coaches about flipping that. See out those kids and then take, especially if they have an assistant coach, plan two or three minutes a week, not a month, not a season, but a week to talk to kids. How are you doing? How are your classes? How's home? What do you think about your role on the team? And we talk about those things. Um, does all of them do it? I, to my knowledge, I think they do in different fashions. Paul Minch would be the first to tell you he, he prided himself in talking to every kid, every practice. And he did it. I watched him do it. And his staff does it. And our coaches on the football team do it still to this day. And it could be something as much as a, a pat on the helmet but it goes a long way to those kids. And then from there, it's, coach, it's parent to coach, and we have athlete involvement, and then parent to AD, and the coaches are a part of that conversation, and then parent to superintendent. Uh -oh. My who? This one? Oh, there we go. We talked about preseason coaches meetings. Uh, we have preseason parent meetings, so once the teams are selected, we have parent meetings at all levels. It could be a five-minute meeting. It could be a very, you know, varsity is a little bit more involved because they're talking about fundraising and, and things that, that might be taking place during the season. Uh, rules and expectations are outlined for parents. We have booster club involvement, so obviously uh, coaches need to be involved in the booster club. Um, they usually have all, all our varsity teams have parent reps who kind of lead that. We don't, we, it's not the coach's responsibility to be fundraising, okay? But they have to have the vision and the philosophy and the plan of what they're looking for. And then they, and then they have our, their reps that will assist them in representing them at the booster club. And then finally, our coaches have gotten more and more involved in the college recruiting process. Um, some of the athlete parents here, you might have heard Huddle. Huddle is a, a filming, a streaming filming system that we have in our district. Allows us to, to capture films uh, of games throughout, you know, home and away events. It allows us to break them down. It allows us um, then to build uh, recruiting videos that we can then send to college coaches and help kids um, if that's an aspiration of them. So that's what I was asked to talk about tonight. Um, I'm always willing to come back and talk anytime, but uh, anybody have any questions? I have a couple questions. <clears throat> so the evaluation tool, is that something that you developed or is that, did we get that from somewhere? I inherited that when I started here 12 years ago. It is much like what takes place in almost every other district. Um, so. So I was curious about because some of the things that they're evaluated on, like one is, is loyal to staff and school personnel. I'm not sure how like that would be something that's that very would be, important. But I'm not sure how that's something that can be observed, like how that would be observed, how that would be. So like, when we oh, talk about working, well, I'll answer it. When we right, talk but about I'm just not finishing my oh, <laughs> go ahead. Question, sorry. Um, so that was one of my questions about you know how some of these um, items are actually observed. And then I also was curious about um, the feedback that you would get from parents and, um, and or students into some of these different areas that are evaluated. 
So I may answer the first mm -hmm. one first. Sure. So the uh, first part of that is um, rephrase what you said because I'm now thinking about the second one. <laughs> So I was well. I started out asking about where this, where it came from, and you said that this is oh, something we inherited. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but now that you asked me about that again, is there has there been any thought to updating this and, and looking at different areas? We have a huge focus in our district on emotional um, wellness and overall wellness of our students. Mm -hmm. So, is there an interest, or has there been thought and consideration in how we can reevaluate? Do this form? Of yeah, definitely. So we we. I attend the state and national conference every single year, and those are those are details that are shared at that conference. Um, and we look at what other districts use across the country. Obviously, things that happen in Texas are a little bit different than what happens here. So we try to take you know compare apples to oranges. Um, you know, many of those things. You know, about your first question is that our staff working well with the rest of the staff. Um, not taking players, not planning things that um, steal players, let's say, from other programs. Um, we work, so best example we can use. Previous years, uh, before I attended here, there was a lot of competition between music and athletics. We have no competition between music and athletics here. Doesn't happen with me. It's not even a conversation. When we have um, concerts, I do everything in my power to work around them. When they have musicals, we clear our schedule. Um, Carlos and I work very closely together to make sure those things don't happen. But if I find out that coaches are then creating conflicts, that's something that we have to address and we have to deal with. Okay? So many times, yeah, maybe it's not observed, but when I get a phone call and says, Scott, why is there a student that says there's a conflict with this concert tonight? Well, I thought we worked that out. We work it out. Um, kids should not be you know, put in the middle of something that adults can work out. Mm -hmm. So um, as for adjusting the evaluation tool, I'm always open to adjusting it. That makes sense for the betterment of our student athletes and the betterment of our district. Anyone else have questions? Hi, Scott. I was just interested in the perform the improvement plans. Are those all in writing as well? And then how do they play into this year-end evaluation? Like, what is the process? Uh, they're written up. They're put into their their file. I guess we'd let's say they're shared. Um, it could be very detailed. It could be you know, some of it could be just you know, some of it's verbal. You know, uh, you had a poor you had a you did a poor uh, job communicating with parents explain to me what your plan is going to be to, to better communicate. So, for example, we're now moving into Parent Square, okay? That is going to be an evolution that's going to allow our coaches for, to better communicate. So, just as an example. It, some of it's going to depend on, you know, how many changes there might be. Obviously, if there's that many issues, there needs to be a change. But likewise, just like we have with our, with our teachers, um, just because somebody maybe struggles in a couple of things, it doesn't mean we're not here to try to help them get better. Okay, so there, it's kind of twofold. Um, I would tell you we made a coaching change about probably eight years ago, and I did improvement plans with the coach. I think it was it was at least two, maybe three years consecutively. That we talked about different things that they need needed to work on and things needed to improve. Um, and then finally, we made a decision. You know, we made a decision to go in a different direction. So, it's twofold. It's some of it's dependent on the situation. Um, yeah, they're they are, they're in writing in some fashion. I wouldn't tell you how in depth they are. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, absolutely. So Scott, can, can we back up a little bit? You, um, you talked about evaluations and at the beginning of your presentation, but what is the, what does success look like? I mean, we talked also about the lack of applicants for coaching positions, and in part, it's a hard job, and if we aren't clearly articulating, you know, what does success mean to be a coach at FM? Is it wins, losses? Is it 
building a robust program? Like, do you have sort of the philosophy of when you recruit coaches, this is what matters the most? I mean, obviously you have your tool that it has a variety of elements on there, but what pieces do you go into to say, you know, this is what I'm going to be measuring your performance mm -hmm. against? So, yes, we, um, some of that depends on the level or the position of the coach. Okay? Um, so obviously a varsity level coach, you know, head coach is, is evaluated differently and the expectations are different than a modified coach. Um, obviously the expectation at each of those levels are a lot different as well. Um, so we have in our, in our philosophy handbook, we have an athletic handbook that the philosophies are in there and it, and it details how you range from the middle school level, the modified level up through the varsity level and how, you know, the, the changing of, uh, learning the sport, you know, learning the skills, uh, becomes less and less important as we get up to the varsity level and then winning does become a little bit more important. The other thing we have to remember is we don't recruit our kids. So it's not all about winning and losing, okay? Um, you know, many of our sports, I, I feel we play in the toughest league in the state. And I have a couple parents here that know the league we play in. Um, when you think that in, in our league, there was a team that lost nine one-goal games last year and didn't qualify for sectionals and has won, I don't know, three or four state titles, it means we're pretty competitive, okay? So for me to sit here, or us as a district to sit here and think that everybody needs to go 10-0, and 0, everybody needs to win sectional titles is not what's most important, okay? But it's part of it because there are, you know, kids don't want to go out and lose. Haven't met a kid at the varsity level that wants to lose games, and the same thing with a coach. So we have to do things that also at that level helps us achieve those goals. So it's, it's definitely goes both ways depending on the level. Thanks. And then I guess my other question was, um, you talked a little bit about this, but I didn't see it up there on like the training perspective. Um, in terms of mental health, DEI training, do our coaching staff go through any sort of formalized courses so that they're aware of all of those issues as they're interacting with their students? So they, they do all the trainings that are required by, by teachers just like anybody else. So they are required to, to complete all those, um, those trainings as well, which includes mental health, which includes sexual abuse, all, all of that. So they, yes, they go through all those trainings as well. Thanks, Scott, for uh, all of the info you provided. It's, uh, you know, you're, you're doing a lot. Um, since I've been on the board, there have been a number of uh, community complaints about, or community mentions of eighth graders being on varsity and, you know, 11th or 12th graders not getting a position because of younger kids. Um, does FM have a position on that, or is it all just based on the coaches? We do have a position. If they're trying out for a varsity position, for a varsity team, grade level does not come into play. Okay? And, and we say that because um, we don't do that in eighth grade math or ninth grade math. Okay? So there's not a rite of passage. Just because you're a, a, a senior, it doesn't mean you're the, the starting point guard on the basketball team. Um, Um, that is very close to being true. Yep. Yeah, the only one that I know that didn't was West Genesee a while ago, and they have since changed that.
I'm going to refrain from answering that. We can agree to disagree. So Scott, let me ask, let me ask this question, and this is not anything about picking teams, but is there conversations about all these coaches are on one-year contracts, right? So is there conversations, I guess, between varsity coaches and JV coaches and ninth grade coaches about we have this open tryout, the varsity team is the top, I don't know, pick a number, 20 kids, right? So, but we have an eighth grader that's really good, right? So is there some conversation between those three coaches about where this person may fall and, and development of that student athlete? Yes. Yep. And so how does that, how does that process work? We talk about where they fit in skill wise and in relation to everybody else that's in the program. Um, I would like you to flip the other side is that if a if an eighth grader let's just no I'm not going to use names if an eighth grader has the skills to be there, why should they be held back well the process is the entire, for the most part, every coaching staff talks about kids in the program. Okay? You saw what our basketball coach does. Okay? So they have these camps, they have these teams, they have summer leagues, they have all this involvement. They have the ability to see the kids in the program. Um, and then from there, they're able to evaluate where kids are going to fall. And likewise, what would happen if somebody moves in the district, let's say, you know, that you can't plan for. That's as most recruiting it that we can do. We recruit our own kids. Um, yep. Yeah, and many times, like uh, many times, our our teams. Um, have all our coaches at the tryout as well. So, for instance, there's one fall sport that had every one of our coaches on the staff at tryouts. The entire staff, varsity through modified. And they evaluated every girl that was at tryouts. Um, that happens routinely. Routinely, we have varsity coaches that go down to the modified level to assist our modified coaches in making cuts. And that happens as well. So it's, there's a, there's a lot of involvement. I do have a question about modified cuts. It does, is, I, I, and I'm minimally there yet with my kids' ages, but I understand that it, it seems that there's more of an inclusive approach to allow as many kids as possible to play seventh and eighth grade sports. Um, except when there's too many kids. So I know maybe Eagle Hill has too many students for the seventh and eighth grade soccer team, but Wellwood doesn't have enough. Uh, and I know, I, I think in the past, sometimes you've mixed, uh, but I'm just wondering, um, as, as we progress to high school, we have a very big high school and only so many spots. I'm just wondering what other opportunities there are for students that maybe aren't at that level where they could play maybe even JV, um, to, to give kids as many opportunities to play as possible. And if there's ever opportunities to even compete interscholastically, even if it isn't a varsity, like as our club level for sports that traditionally are JV and varsity. In-house, there's, there's not probably as many offerings as there, there could be. There's just, there's just not um, much there. Many times we will redirect people to a rec program if we know they go up to a certain age level, let's say, or if we know that there's a club level. Um, so a, a good example, and it doesn't reference FM, but my best friend lives in Orlando, Florida. He lives in Lake Nona. If you want to look up Lake Nona, it's probably one of the largest growing districts in the country. His son was cut from, from JV baseball. There was 80 kids that tried out. He never played high school sports ever again. But he went on and played club and rec around the area. And that happens to many kids because at that level, you know, kids haven't developed yet. You might miss a kid. And he's told me that a lot of kids will go on and play in college 
just because there's just so many kids. So it, we try to do our best to redirect them to, you know, okay, there's a senior league baseball team that maybe you can play, or there's a, you know, there's a rec basketball team. So some of our basketball players play in the, they play at IC in the CYO league. So we just try to redirect them to that organization that, that then they can get those experiences. And maybe they come back out and try out for us, or maybe they don't. In terms of like continuous improvement of the program, what, how do you get feedback from the coaching staff, parents, and, and students, um, and particularly students, about their experience in the program? And how is that used? I mean, can you think of, I don't put you on the spot, but is there an example of how maybe a coach has something like to come up with an idea or a parent um, to improve the program that we've acted on? But mostly, how do you get that feedback from them? So twofold. We have some coaches that do exit interviews. Um, just, you know, how was your experience? And they'll talk about, where, you know, what do you, especially it's like your, your you know, sophomores or uh, juniors, you know, what are we looking forward to? from you in the future. So that's directly with the coach. Um, last year I started meeting with all our graduating seniors. So hypothetically the baseball team is done, you know, you had two seniors, come on in, come on in and let's chat. Um, <clears throat> I worked with Dr. Tice on a, on a survey that we didn't implement at the end of the year last year, we're gonna do this year, he's gonna, you know, go through the questions um, that, that I've developed and just make sure that we're all set with that and that's gonna go out. We're gonna, we need to tailor it so there's a, the, there's a parent response but then there's a student response as well. So it's gonna be about the same survey, okay? But um, obviously there's different questions that you might ask a parent than th that you might ask a, a student. So that will be twofold that will run this year e at the end of each season. Two separate. Yeah, two separate. Because obviously the, you know, like I say to parents sometimes when I meet with them, you know, I'm not in the gymnasium every single day. You know, that's something that's got to come from the kid about what, you know, what their experience was. And sometimes they won't say it verbally. They won't, you know, we, I'm sure he, the gentleman before me would tell me, tell the same information, that there's things that they will respond to in confidence that they wouldn't say in a room. Uh, with somebody else, so I think that's going to be a little bit more effective, and then we, then we take a look at it and make changes or improvements that we need to. Additional questions for Scott, Chrissy as well. I just wanted to touch back to the eighth grader point. From my understanding, we do not the there's not a written policy. Eighth graders can try out for freshmen, JV, and varsity, and mm -hmm. their talent d dictates that. Yep. I was just curious, and this isn't necessarily tied to athletics, but do we have a policy in place for the music program? Can our eighth graders try out for the high school musical or those select singing groups, band groups, or orchestras? It's just a question I have out to the group. I, it's my understanding, I, I don't know if any have, if it's ever come up, but just in the realm of equity, just thought I'd put it out there. Yeah, as you know, we don't call them varsity, JV, or whatever. I mean, there's different or <laughs> orchestras or bands and so forth. But they're, the deck, the deck is shuffled to allow the ability level to fit. I mean, a child isn't put in a situation where they're in over their head. But we do allow other students to move up based on the particular instrument and so forth. It's all like whether it's a coach or um, you know a conductor or whoever. It's the adult who decides this student is the right one to ask to move up. It's not student driven, right? Like the student doesn't say, "I That's want correct. I want to try out for varsity." That they have to be asked. Or that same thing correct. with music or whatever. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. They're not open invitations. Um, they may I, aspire. What's to, that? They may aspire and want to and exactly. hope to get asked. But yeah. You know. And do you want to say a word about as they move up from modified to JV to varsity? I mean, if a, a child is moving up from eighth grade in terms of the expectation to play, they're not uh, fill a roster spot or a bench spot. 
No, we talk about if you're going to move them up, they should be playing often. So um, I would I, I first want to clarify. You know, there's a lot of talk about eighth graders playing up. Um, we have, and, and don't quote me on these numbers, so don't write them down. We have maybe three eighth graders swimming. We have one field hockey player, I believe. And I think that's it. So these questions seem like there's a wave of all these things happening. And I, I could be off a little bit with the numbers. Um, but it's very few and far in between. Okay? Because those kids have been identified by their coach and move up. Now, swimming's easy because there's a number related to that. Okay? Golf, there's a number related to that. It's easy to see those things. Um, you know, probably our biggest one that, that happens is tennis because we don't have a modified program yet. Hopefully, is Brad still here? Hopefully Brad will support a modified team next year because we have so much interest in modified tennis. Yes, that will be in my budget request in December that we just need to have more, um, more, more opportunities for kids that want to play tennis. Okay. Um, And do you want to say a word too about player development? I know at the modified level, the expectation is everybody plays not an equal amount, yeah. but as equitable as it can be. In yeah, terms there's of participation. so there's rules at the at the at the middle at modified level that require our coaches for kids to play a certain amount of time. It's it's bound by state rules. So we could have a kid who um, who maybe is out of place at the eighth grade level and we get pressure from the parents of the, Johnny's not playing enough. But there's only three quarters in the basketball game that Johnny's allowed to play by rule because there's a lot of equal playing time at the mod modified level, um, which is great for all kids, but could hinder our higher level kids. Could, not guaranteed. Um, so if a kid moves up, we always talk about with the coaches that they should be pl they should be playing. Maybe if it's a field player or a court player, it should be half the game, um, at least. Um, I always tell coaches if you're bringing a kid up, even a ninth grader, I'm talking about eighth graders, but even a ninth grader, I should walk into your gym or walk into your you know your rink or your field, and I should recognize that kid. They should stand out to me, and if they do that, they're they're rightly placed. If they fit right in, they're probably not in the right spot. And maybe we have that discussion, you know, should we consider moving, and this has happened before, should we consider moving this kid back to JV? Would that be a right fit? Um, so with development, that also comes into play. I always talk about a goal score. When I was at Oswego, we had a, a girl that played on the uh, Olympic ice hockey team. She was pretty good at ice hockey. She played lacrosse. Well, let's start there. During her eighth grade year as an ice hockey player, she scored 66 goals. She played JV lacrosse and scored 56. Now, I say that because she really had never played lacrosse before. She was just a pure talent. So at the time, we wanted her to play JV because we thought developmentally that was the right spot for her. So she played JV, and then immediately when sectionals came around, we moved her up because she was a great goal scorer, and we needed her for sectionals. Um, so that's an example of that happens even here, where we try to put kids, in, and it's not perfect, but we try to do our best to put the kid in the right spot that is going to allow their developmental uh, abilities, and then so they can progress through the year. So we have kids in, on teams this fall I could name that maybe have been held down to the JV level because there's kids at the varsity level that are just more skilled than them. They wouldn't, yes, they could make the team, but they wouldn't play. So we, we leave them down as a, even a sophomore. We get, they play all the time. Their, their confidence is, is through the roof so that next year as a junior, we know they're going to be full contributors. So we want to try to, to build a plan for each of those kids that we can see their development each year. 
Scott, I just want to say, my husband, who's a retired school administrator, always has said, next to the superintendent, the AD's job is perhaps the most difficult because you have to be in so many places. So I don't want to have, <laughs> I feel as if you're annoyed with me. No, um, not at I, all. <laughs> I just want to say for the record, a student who excels in eighth grade will still excel in ninth, 10th, and 11th. Mm -hmm. And so why not give the 10th, 11th, 12th graders the, the spot? And you don't have to answer me. I no. just, I have to say it because I have to say it. I just had one more question. I was glad to hear, and I think I understood this because my, my um, kids weren't, my daughter did crew, so it was a very different world. My daughter does too. Yeah, very it's different a great world. sport. Yes, I miss those days. Um, but you had mentioned like there are coaches who do like clinics and things for kids, which in our community I think is a very helpful thing because just by the sake of what this community is, you have a lot of kids who are able to do a lot of different trainings from very young ages to, yep. to really promote their athleticism. So I was wondering, um, in terms of that, like equipment, because these sports are so expensive. I mean, I think baseball was like, I was mm -hmm. astounded how much a baseball bat costs. <laughs> um, so is it the Booster Club? I think I read somewhere, heard somewhere that the Booster Club has like equipment that kids can, like if they can't afford something, or is it FM, how is that? We do, so we the district is. How do we support, like, and how do parents and athletes find out about that? Like, what, what do we do that supports them in that so way? So the biggest number one sport for this is lacrosse. Happens every year. Doug Madden be the mm -hmm. first to tell you, we get five, six, seven parents that call and say, Johnny's never played lacrosse before. Is there anything we can get so we don't have to buy all the equipment? Mm -hmm. And we have helmets, we have shoulder pads, we have gloves. We, we've actually had to throw some out because our previous coaches just hoarded things, which was great because whenever ever anybody called, we could, we could hand those out. So they just make a phone call and we, you know, and then if it's something obscure that maybe we don't have, um, we'll try to find a way maybe with the help of the boosters to, to purchase those things. Yep. Help them, happens all the time. Yeah, Scott, I, I just, I'm biting my tongue a little bit this evening. Um, you, you know my girls have been in this athletic program for a very long time. I, I look at this School of Distinction and School of Excellence Awards and my, my girls have pins in each and every one of those mm -hmm. years on those teams. Um, I, I am grateful for the time that our coaches put into these teams at every level educationally, but not just on the field, in the pool, on the court, because I've seen it, I've been part of it firsthand, the development that they work on with these student athletes as students in humans first and athletes second. And we are blessed at this district to have tremendously dedicated people leading these programs and I'm grateful for them. I, I get I get concerned when we have this discussion that focuses on, on, on the edge case versus the entire program. Um, in all the years that my children have been in varsity sports, which goes back many years now between the two of them, my, my oldest was an eighth grade varsity athlete because there was only a varsity team. She could have swum as a seventh grader, she didn't. She was asked to, she didn't. My youngest, when we talk about whether they are ready or not, you know was the smallest and youngest player on the girls' soccer team as a freshman. And she got a lot of grief for being on the team as a freshman. Is she too small, is she too young? Um, started, went to regionals, made all league. The coaches evaluate the athletes based on who belongs there and they spend an incredible amount of time doing that. And, and I think we start to make mistakes when we start hyper-evaluating from the outside based on the edge cases. We don't do this in the classroom with our teachers. We don't ask our teachers to do end-of-year parent feedback surveys to evaluate whether they should be changing their teaching style in the classroom. I, mean, I know many parents would have a lot of opinions on doing so, but we don't do that with our teachers. And I don't believe that we should be doing that with our coaches. And I'm, I'm very grateful for the time and effort. As you said, coaches and refereeing are the two most least, the two least thanked jobs that we have. 
and they get the most external grief because everybody is an expert in what they do. Um, so I just want to just I th say I th my piece on that. I completely agree with you, and I, I thank our kids. If you come to our January or our June banquet, I thank our kids every single year because they wear our colors and they wear our name and they have a number to be identified. And then the results are put in social media to be judged. Think about that. Math scores aren't. So Scott, just to piggyback on what Dan's point, um, I think part of the reason why the board wanted to have you come and present today was we wanted the community to be able to hear what processes are in place so that they know how our coaches are being supported and that there is a process, that it's not just some a community member, if they have a particular concern, that there's a way to express that concern and how we want to encourage our students to be involved in that process. Um, but I guess I would also like to ask you how the board can better support our coaching staff to make sure that coaches want to come here and they are such, they can play such a pivotal role in impacting our students overall experience at the school and in the future. A lot of students come back and think about their sports career is, or they had a coach that really changed their perspective on a lot of things. It's a trusted adult that's outside of the academic walls. So if there are things that this board can be doing to further reinforce that, um, I hope we're open to feedback too sure. on that side of things. I'd be glad to. Any further questions or comments? All right, thank you very much. Sure, anytime. Okay, next item on the agenda, item 2.03, the statistical report, part one, enrollment data. Good evening and thank you for uh, having me come tonight to give you an update on our hiring stats as well as our enrollment. We've been working on this um, back to January, February. We really started looking at wh what were our estimates in terms of how many classes did we need, how many teachers will we need, how many students do we think are going to come. So uh, using Jeff Gordon's model for his presentation from last year, you'll see similar reports here this year. Uh, with a little bit of uh, some of my own edits and changes here. So I'll begin by first saying that we have 23 new teaching positions that were filled this year, as opposed to 28 last year. 18 of those appointments are probationary appointments, where last year there were 17. Five of the appointments are regular substitutes or long-term substitutes. Six of our openings are due to teacher retirements and we have the early retirement incentive which is very helpful so that you can project who do you need to send out ads in OLAS or other places to advertise and look for staff so we can begin early looking for teachers we had seven teacher resignations for various reasons 10 in 2022 four of those resignations people were leaving to return closer to their home or their family one person uh, returning to an urban district, one accepted an assistant principal promotion in another district, and then one was leaving education altogether to go to the private industry. So of our new instructional staff, 91% of our teachers hired for this year hold a master's degree, which uh, is very good. There was 86% last year, so uh, very good. We do have a career ladder program here which helps pay for classes and then also credits uh, individuals uh, credit hours as they move forward on the salary scale so that is an incentive and something we should continue to highlight and praise uh, to recruit people here 
The cohort currently has uh, an average of 14.3 years of a teaching experience, so we've brought in some very experienced teachers as well. So something else to be very proud of. And we have one teacher who returned to New York from Connecticut. Now looking at our enrollment trends, we're up about 18 students uh, this year, um, which I, I really have to give a shout out to Sandy. Sandy was helping, she's uh, my new assistant. Every week we were watching the enrollment trends of students coming in to the district, trying to keep an eye on, did we you know, plan for enough sections? Are there other sections we need to open? Are there shifts we need to make? And so Sandy, uh, you know, great work in terms of keeping that uh, and monitoring all that work for us. We also work with BOCES and they pull reports for us and then we have staff here and the student support uh, system, our services office that also pulls reports. So we really do keep a really good uh, close eye on student enrollment and this enrollment is as of um, last Thursday. The kindergarten numbers, uh, this was, uh, it's very interesting. We're tied with last year. <laughs> when Jeff was presenting this data last year, we do have some ups and downs in some of the buildings. We did get a little nervous at Fayel because we were getting um, quite a few kindergarten students at the last minute. And then last week before school, we were just kind of waiting it out to see, you know, were we gonna have to send students somewhere else, which was not something we wanted to do at all. We didn't have to face that, so all of our students are in their home schools where they should be. So this is sort of an overview of each of these schools and the number of students by grade level. I've uh, separated UPK. It was sort of tied to Mott Road um, just for like reporting purposes, but uh, we are up to 116 UPK students. This time last year, Jeff was reporting about 95. And then that number you know, kind of crept up to about 100 students, and now we're at 116 UPK students, which is very, very good. Um, something to be very proud of. So the total number of students enrolled as of September 7th is 4,262 students, which takes us up a total of 39 students over last year. When we prepare for the sections to make sure that we have enough sections by grade level, we do that also in the spring and we meet with, with our leaders and some of the data that we really need to factor in when we're looking at these sections are enrollment trends at each level, where do we think we're gonna be up or down by grade levels, the fluctuating enrollment, students who are entering FM and then those who may be exiting. So these are kind of, some of these are guesses but we have to give it our best guess and look at past history to try to come up with the estimates. And then space and capacity at each of the buildings, we have to be very mindful of that as well. And um, then keeping in mind all those special areas, the gym, art, music, library, all those special areas that we need room for. And then also keeping an eye on residential growth and development in the area to see, do we expect to see more students in one school or another? and you know, really being mindful of that and, and keeping an eye on that. <clears throat> this year we increased our um, sections by two classes and that was due to some of the enrollment trends that we anticipated and rightfully so, we were very glad we did that so that we were able to uh, have each of those classes and grade levels covered. This was a slide that Jeff had in and I left it in because I thought this was very interesting when we talk about the teacher shortage areas and the, the, the number of applicants that we've seen reduce over the years, 2015, then he showed you the 2019, and then last year he showed you 2022. Well, I wanted to show you this year, just in these three areas, to show where we're at in elementary still, not where it used to be, um, you know, and reading, very low, two candidates and then band, um, our most recent round of band interviews and the applicants was at 18. So I did include in the um, reports to the board the list of all the applicants by tenure areas and you can take a look at that. If you have any other questions for me on that, let me know, but uh, we're still certainly in a teacher uh, shortage or declining uh, area where we don't have as many applicants as we, we had years ago. 
So some of the things that we're still seeing happening in central New York and also around the nation, teacher poaching. Um, we have some people trying to, as I shared, four people went to other districts uh, close to their home or close to their families. We also had people apply to positions here in FM and they were leaving their districts to come here. Um, districts are, you may have seen some of the news articles, are hiring staff with a, with a bachelor's degree and no certification and then working with them to try to get them certified. And I'm proud to report that all of our teachers are certified. So um, th that's really something else for us to be proud of. Nationwide, it's very interesting, 876 school districts around the country in Colorado, New Mexico, Idaho, Oklahoma, Oregon, and Texas have gone to a four-day work week. Their work week is a little bit longer so that they get their instruction, you know, instructional minutes in, but it's, it's uh, I guess their attempt of trying to see will this help with the teacher shortage. So I put the article in the resource there uh, if you want to check that out, but I'm going to be watching that. That's, I don't know if that's something we would do here in New York, but it's interesting to see that others are, are going in that pathway. So then what can we consider doing uh, here in FM? We do need to continue to market and advertise the wonderful benefits of working here in FM. This is a great place to work, a great place to teach, and so uh, we'll be continuing to put together some of those marketing and advertising uh, you know, documents to put out. Um, we're looking at putting together a pilot program to have some of our teaching assistants become teachers. And so Amy and I will be working on that this year. And then we're gonna continue to recruit um, diverse teachers in and outside of New York State to come here to FM. What the state can do and what we can do is we can continue to ask the state to um, you know, advocate for changing the APPR regulations. Uh, it would be great to have an evaluative model that truly does give our staff that feedback and the growth opportunities that they need to continue to improve in their craft and not just a numbers-based <laughs> evaluation. So um, advocacy also needed for New York State Ed, a true reciprocity where we could recognize a teacher's certificate from another state if they come here and um, grant them certification. It's a little complicated now. It's, it's not that equivalent. So advocacy for that would be um, really helpful. And then if we could look at uh, potentially advocating for teachers to go back to getting certification issued to them once they finish a teacher pathway accredited program at a college or university. Some of those uh, teacher exams have really sort of gotten out of control. They, were, they have pull, pulled back on some of them. They have done some changes, but we need to continue to advocate and ask the state to consider doing more. And then one, uh, one other thing that I, there's so much we could really talk about <laughs> and do, but another item is this uh, pension waiver. That has helped us bring back a few teachers this year to help us through some of our regular sub and long-term sub needs. Uh, when we had shortage of teachers available to us to take on a probationary appointment. So continued advocacy for a pension a waiver for hopefully another year, and then after that, hopefully the state will look at some kind of a tiered approach to um, that pension waiver. They set it at $35,000, but it would be nice if they could maybe base that on some kind of a tiered salary approach just some of my ideas but we can <laughs> and we'll certainly think of other things so um, just to quote dr. Martin Luther King the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically intelligence plus character that is the goal of true education and this cute picture came from our website I loved it <laughs> so any questions um, in terms of advocacy, um, are you hearing, um, are you, are we seeing any impact from the tier six, the disparity the in that, pension, yeah. and how that's affecting younger people who want to go into teaching, um, because they may likely not do it now, considering the right, because they have to. The very contribute poor. for their entire career. Yes, and there's never that. It's a very big difference from what current te you know people who've been in a little bit longer have done. Right. So is that something that you would add to the advocacy list, and I is that something you think is affecting this? 
Yeah, I think uh, you're, you're on target there, and that's definitely something we should add to our advocacy uh, list uh, when we talk to legislators and talk to the state or others, you know, about uh, what, what do we think is sort of stopping people or swaying them from making a decision to come into education. And uh, President Mims, I think you're right on there. That's definitely something that we're going to see um, going forward that might, that might uh, curtail people from coming into the field. Lisa, uh, thank you. One thing that I know Jeff talked about before was the high percentage of um, teachers who tend to return to wherever they grew up. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if there's been any discussion about, I know I've seen national articles about like kind of a grow your own program within the high school. So giving students more exposure to a career in teaching outside of just obviously seeing the teachers that they interact with, but what it's really like to become a teacher and how that path would grow to try to encourage more of our students to maybe look to uh, go into teaching after they graduate. Uh, that's, that's another program that I was uh, very fortunate to see uh, develop and then grow in the city, and it's absolutely something that, you know, I'll, I'll talk to Dr. Tice about, but it's one of the CTE pathways and you can get kids so ignited and excited about teaching and they already start learning, you know, some of the classes and then taking classes and then can, you know, j just see, is this something that I'm really interested in? Is it something I wanna do? But that's certainly something we should explore and put on our list of ideas and ways to give kids opportunities and experience, exposure, you know, this is what it is. These, these are the standards, these are the plans, this is how, you know, just start introducing them to the whole field. Great. So Lisa, two questions for you on the numbers. Um, so for the enrollment trends, right? So we factor in COVID. Um, I know it's not on the chart, but do you have any idea where we are in terms of kids that are homeschooled within the district? Amy does have that number, but she's in the, here. Does anyone else have that homeschool? I don't think so. Well, we can get that to you. Yeah, but that's fine. Um, and then the second one was, is I know the UPK number is at 116. At some point this summer, we had a wait list. Do we know where we, did we, were we able to get everybody in or do we still have kids that are, were on the wait list that did not get in? I think we still have some, but um, 38, 38 still on the list. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Hi, Sammy. Hi, quick question. What do you see as the steps needed to take to change the APPR? scoring rubric so that it is more of a comprehensive response? Well, I believe there is discussion and legislation that has been coming up and surfacing up that there's, there's been uh, quite a bit of advocacy already to look at that and to change it. Um, I think we just need to continue in the school board's conferences that we're attending or in you know, if we have legislators that we have connections to, talking to them, but I, I really believe that there's got to be, you know, a, a really good <laughs> push and a change for this. I know Mary Pajulis, if she's still here, uh, the FMTA and the you know teachers unions are certainly advocating for that as well. So, I think unity in terms of us all coming together and, and saying, you know, we really need something that helps our educators grow and develop. Uh, you know, not a gotcha or not a, just a number. It's just, you know. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. I was just I going through your chart of applications, interviews, hired. And, yes. And I'm, I'm just curious. I, I, obviously, the application numbers are lower than what we'd want because mm -hmm. of the shortage. Got it. What's our win rate, though? When we, when we find somebody that we want mm -hmm. and we offer the position to, mm -hmm. at what rate if you know mm -hmm. are they accepting those offers i can speak to what happened with me this year i only had one person decline the offer and it was because uh, she was from out of state it got pretty late into august and transitioning moving back here now this is someone who was from this area but moved away and wanted to move back but in terms of moving back that quickly and getting her children and everyone settled it just that wasn't an opportunity for her to be able to do that, so she did decline. Everyone else that I've experienced this year, 
when we went out for an offer, they accepted. I mean, that's so. that's a pretty good indicator, right? Uh, right. That's, that's that's an indicator that mm -hmm. we probably ought to be, if you're not already highlighting in the hire process, right. that that of the we, offers, what we work hard to find the people that we really want in right. this district. Yes. But that's also an indicator that the people really want the positions that's because right. there's a lot of people <laughs> interviewing for a lot of positions, and, mm -hmm. and then they pick and choose if right. they're taking the offers mm -hmm. at that rate. That's I'd look at that as a That's definite a win positive, too, right? for sure. Yes, thank you. Lisa, thank you. This is a wonderful presentation. I'm, I'm interested from the sectioning standpoint. You have a slide, uh, page 7, that talks about elementary sectioning. Is middle school and high school a similar? I mean, I know their classes are structured differently, but is that same consideration given to class size at those levels, and does it look any different in terms of what you think about? Yeah, that's great. When because when okay, great question. When we meet in the spring with all of the principals, we do look at those numbers to say, do we have a huge number of students coming up from fourth grade that's going to be a, a bigger increase as we go into fifth, and then correspondingly when we have sixth going into seventh, are we seeing an up, you know, <laughs> increase where we really need to look at, do we have enough sections? Do we have enough um, room? Do we have that capacity? So we are doing that. And then at high school, it was really great. Um, what Ray did this year, he actually showed me how the whole schedule is built and how the students are looked at and then the process that they go through in order to verify that students are in the right classes and so he really broke it down and, and explained it to me so that I could see how do we make sure we have enough um, you know, teachers for the classes that we're going to offer or that we need to offer. And so it, that whole process does take place in the spring too where we're looking at numbers for each grade level and how many kids are moving up. And if we saw a big um, increase again from eighth grade moving to ninth, we may be then looking to come to create additional positions if needed or if we have a corresponding big reduction we may be looking at something else but uh, our numbers don't speak that we're going to be having uh, if you look at the history you know over the last 10 years or so but great question it does take a lot of um, eyes on the numbers and the classes and the each year you know of kids moving up but then how many move into the district and how many move out too each year so studying those trends is important too strikes me that we're talking about the teacher shortages and um, maybe what's not reflected on this slide is just teacher retention and retaining the amazing staff that we have right um, and all the things that the district does to, mm -hmm. to support um, our teachers our educators and our staff mm -hmm. um, and then the other piece that I'm just thinking about is around and again I don't want to put you on the spot but just the pipeline you know thinking about hiring more diverse staff and I'm just interested in what our process what you know in your new position what mm -hmm. that process looks like to think creatively and maybe outside the box to, mm -hmm. to, con to continue to push on hiring diverse hires even in a, in a shortage mm -hmm. climate mm -hmm. that's great and that's where some of those advocacies are needed because <laughs> I'm trying to think a little bit differently about potentially can we go look at other people from other states to come in? Because the competition in New York State, everyone's competing for those same limited number of diverse candidates. So if we can maybe look at something different by going outside of the state and then having that true reciprocity, uh, looking at those individuals' resumes and making sure that they will meet the current standards for the reciprocity. And if not, then again, continuing to advocate for the state to say, you know, if we want to have a diverse staff that looks and represents our students and our student population we do have to do things differently we're going to have to advertise in different um, places um, than we are now we need to advertise in, in um, many differing uh, publications online as well as in print and we're really going to have to think of doing some things a little bit differently and be open to inviting people and being that welcoming place for everyone to come to I think our DEI initiatives speak to some of the work that we're willing to do as a community and as a school district, and that shows, you know, this is a community that's welcoming to all. And, and so continuing to do that and marketing, like I said, the marketing and the advertising is 
it's really going to be important for us to do and get out early this district does a great job of that and keeping that trend to get out early as students are getting ready to graduate get out and go to the colleges or um, you know personally do one-to-one -one interviews with with candidates so. thank you my la my last thought on that is just you know sherry you're in charge of legislative as our legislative liaison just making sure we put a pin in how we could support some of that advocacy as we think about the NISBA convention and putting right. proposed resolutions forward, maybe those two New York State specific, um, you know, themes we could we could think about okay. putting forward. Yeah. Thank you. I do believe that that thank you. has come up, and uh, one of NISBA's positions is to advocate for uh, for to make it easier to get reciprocity. I'd have Great. to look that up to don't quote me on that, but I I'm pretty sure I remember that happening. I can help with some talking points if you need, because <laughs> I, I would really love to see that happen. I, I don't remember that specifically coming up, but again, I'd have to look back through all of NISBA's positions. Um, I've been to the meetings the past, I think four out of the past five years, and uh, it's just like going through my head, did we discuss this? Mm -hmm. And I do remember the discussion about, uh, about reciprocity I don't specifically remember a PPR um, but that's one it's too late to bring up this year but it could be for next year <laughs> okay but well, we we may okay. hear more about that from the blue ribbon Commission along with the Regents exam so I think this fall okay. all right thank you thank you very much <clears throat> Okay, moving on to item 2.04, the President's Report. I sent out an update to everyone today with some additional items for the retreat agenda. Um, if you're not going to be there, please let us know um, so we can plan accordingly. Um, the DEI committee, um, just about ready to hit send on an email to the DEI committee um, to see, to gather the work that's been done over the summer so that we can, the, D, the board DEI committee can meet with the facilitators and talk about next steps. Annual report, I believe I've gotten reports from each committee now. Is there any committee who has not responded yet? Thank you. Did you have a question, Rebecca? No. Okay. I'm wondering if we could have all of that in one document, just so we, mm -hmm. maybe. The, you talk about the DEI or the? No, no the, the, the report out for each committee, just so we had a one or two pager that could summarize all the work that's been done by committee for the board. Okay. Just cutting and pasting from the emails. I mean, I'd even be happy to do it. Just I think it would be nice to have it in one place. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what else. Um, I think that was it, all that I had. Um, but again, just let us know if you're not going to be able to attend that uh, retreat that we're having next week. Dr. Tice, your first report. Certainly, President Mims. Uh, under superintendent's report, the backup information is located there for you. Capital project update. Uh, now that the installation of the new turf and the resurfacing of the track is complete, the high school's construction project continues with work in the courtyard, which will be adjacent to the expanded cafeteria. A new technology addition at the front of the and the new technology addition at the front of the building. It's worth mentioning that the temporary classroom uh, suite became operational for the start of the school year, and will provide much needed swing space for the teachers, students who may find themselves displaced during the construction project. Under capital transfer projects, as mentioned before, our capital transfer projects at Enders Road and Fayel are nearing completion. The projects include the safety and security entrance at Enders Road, uh, which is down to punch list items, and air conditioning at Fayetteville Elementary. I updated the board uh, earlier today as they were pressure testing the system. Uh, the AC uh, still will, after the pressure testing, awaiting commissioning by the engineers. Under COVID update, I'd like to thank our Capital Region BOCES communication team for making modifications to our COVID information on the school district website. Uh, the district office team is working with the individual buildings to make optional resources av available to staff and students, especially with this uptick in COVID. Uh, COVID test kits are being dispatched uh, to the OCM BOCES through action by 
The governor and I have asked our allocation be, to be delivered to the district in the near future on the test kits. Under new educator orientation, I'd like to thank Dr. Catherine Dawton and Ms. Lisa Wade for organizing and delivering our new educator orientation before the start of the school year. Uh, after the general introductions, I had a chance to sit in in the morning and it was inclusive of all the new hires and I think helped to set expectations, but also to offer support to our newest employees. So well done to the two of them. And opening a school, I'm pleased to report that the start of school went very smoothly and was relatively uneventful. I'd like to extend my sincere appreciation to the faculty, staff, and administrators who worked tirelessly in preparation for the return of the students. That ends my first report. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Tice on his first report? Okay. Second report, please, on mental health services. Certainly, same thing. Uh, the backup information is under 2.06 for you as well. Under mental health, additional mental health services, we've talked about this before, the beginning of the school year, plans are underway for the arrival of the Promise Zone specialists from Coordinated Care Services. And talking with Ms. Evans, they're still in the process of interviewing and trying to secure those Promise Zone specialists, uh, which we were hoping to have at the beginning of the school year. Our uh, student assistance counselor from C Contact Community S uh, Services, which will staff the drop-in clinics. We have the high school clinic uh, operational and we're, they are still advertising for the middle school uh, student assistance counselor. And as mentioned before, school officials are working with Onondaga County and Arise to establish the three therapeutic uh, clinics, one each at both middle schools and the high school in an effort to reduce the travel time. Arise will build the family's insurance plan for these services. I know Ms. Evans has worked tirelessly to try to get uh, the office space approved for these clinics and we're hoping to have those operational mid-year. Staff mental health, the mental health and well-being of the staff was a focus on the first professional learning days of the school year. I'd like to thank Dr. Melissa Carmen, CEO and founder of CNY Mental Health Cl uh, Counseling, Ms. Amanda Ward, uh, one of her counselors and our very own mental health educator from Contact Community Services, Mr. Will DeSantis, for co-presenting a session on faculty wellness, taking care of ourselves and each other. In addition to Dr. Carmen and Ms. Ward, they also unveiled a new series of supports from CNY Mental Health Counseling as a result of the recent RFP last year, including the facilitation of staff member focus groups in an effort to continue the dialogue. And special thank you to Dr. Doughton for organizing uh, the slate of activities at the beginning of the year along with uh, her faculty uh, teacher leaders. And finally, research and marketing strategies. As I said earlier, following tonight's presentation about last spring's school climate and culture survey, which was administered to students in grades five through 12, later on in the agenda, you will see I will ask for your support to have these professional services continued for RMS to serve as a third party vendor, which means to continue the administration of these anonymous and confidential school climate surveys to staff members, students, and their families. The plan for the upcoming year is to administer a staff survey and the first student survey sometime in the autumn, followed by the family survey and second survey student survey administration sometime in the spring. That concludes my second report. Questions for Dr. Tyson, second report. Cindy? Uh, first is just a comment that I think it's a great way to start the year to do some focus for the, our staff um, on mental health and well-being. I think that was a great way to begin the year. Um, my second question is when the survey is given to staff, will that also be given to non-instructional staff as well? Yeah, they started by saying faculty, but I think we've got to include faculty and staff and include it. It may mean different parts of a survey and faculty do one part and staff do another or depending on the model that Pat talked about tonight, maybe they have something that fits both, kind of a one size fits all. all right. But we will work with them just like we did before in developing that. So when I okay. say fall, it won't just happen right away. Usually the September and October right. will be the planning if we're shooting for an early November administration. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Tyson, I just have a question on the, the survey planning. So 
I'm glad we finally did it. I'm glad we're continuing to do it. Um, but are, are we doing, is the plan going forward to be doing students twice a year? Or are we doing these annually? The question was, because we administered it in the spring and just in the event that there were some town confounding variables affecting the results, such as the end of the year and testing and everything there, we thought we would administer twice, once in the fall, once in the spring. And if those results are similar and statistically insignificant, then we'll go to one administration in on the out years. So we just want to make sure that the results we got, and it's great to do another spring survey to kind of do pre and post and compare it uh, from one year to the next. But we're trying to see if there's a difference between the beginning of the year, the end of the year, does the stress ramp up and so forth. So the idea is to administer it twice this year with the hope of going to one administration in the out years. Okay, thank you. And we're trying to be cognizant of the biomass and everything else. We don't want to have a little survey fatigue, which I am trying to read between the lines of your question. Any additional questions? None? Okay. We'll move on to 2.07, Committee Representative Updates. Let's see. Nothing from audit, correct? Or do we have something from audit? Uh -huh. Community relations it hasn't met since our last meeting, correct? Correct. Okay. Our CAP region folks used to be together at the same time on Tuesdays. That has changed to Thursdays with the new hires. Okay. Um, anything new from facilities, Dan? Any? Jason, uh, I can give you a brief outline. Okay. Oh, Jason, you want to do it? <laughs> well, uh, it's pretty much all good news. Um, the asbestos abatement that was scheduled for 2023 is completed. The nurse's office, 2209-2211, completed. Um, the boiler room pipe reinstallation is underway, but the, let's see, offices in 2201-2202. Uh, the National Grid gas line relocation is completed. The Windstream phone line relocation is completed. The modular classrooms, as Dr. mentioned, are in use, and the kids love them. Um, number seven, as you know, the AC at Fayel is just about complete. We're in the testing uh, phase, and the storefront at Enders Road is complete. And um, King, King and King has offered to do, or we've asked them to do, renderings that will be prepared before open house at the high school so that the projected project will be shown to parents and families. Um, is there anything else, Doctor? No. Thank you. And then policy? Meeting tomorrow. Okay, and you've, <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a lot on your plate for legislative lead. So <laughs> legislative lead is on, I've taken notes on uh, things that Lisa suggested we uh, advocate. Um, we also talked, Marissa and I talked about writing a letter um, to advocate for the, um, for help with the ta veterans tax, tax exemption. Um, and if any of you have any talking points that you'd like me to include that in that letter, just send me an email because I'll be working on that shortly. Um, and then um, the last thing is that the uh, NISBA did send out their resolutions packet, the, the proposed resolutions. I don't, do you guys get that email or? Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask, I, we have a board meeting scheduled um, well, the, 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 actual meet, the actual annual meeting where we vote on these is October 16th, which we do have a board meeting, and as in previous years, I will attend the um, business meeting instead, and I'll join the board meeting when I can. But in order to get your opinions about wh whether I should vote for or against things in the proposed resolutions book, um, I, I think we have a board meeting on October 2nd. Um, I'd like to suggest that we discuss it then during my report so I will make sure you all have a copy of it before then so you can read through and decide for or against on each resolution and Chrissy you're new to this so I'll 
to help to help you through it if you need it. <laughs> so, Sherry, the letter that we're working on is for all of the exemptions, right? Yes. Okay. okay. Veterans. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Welcome, Angela. How you doing? <laughs> Angeline, don't worry. We didn't expect a report this Hi. evening. <laughs> I can do a report. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. So, um, so overall, the students are excited for the start of the school year. Um, for the freshmen, um, Link Crew was very successful, and students reported like they were very happy that the leaders were very good at the team bonding and ice breaking parts. So good for the leaders. Um, there was still a struggle to find the classrooms, but the leaders really helped, and so overall the freshmen feel that they're ready for high school. Um, but people said that they wish that they maintain further contact with the link crew leaders so that it wasn't just like a few days deal. Um, and uh, just during the weekend, uh, a link crew dance was hosted and that was fun. Um, for the sophomores, um, their first fundraiser has already been held at the Daily Diner um, this weekend too, and it was a great success. Um, no news for the junior class, but for the seniors, a senior sunrise has already taken place on the first day of school, and there were a lot of fun and games, and a lot of people attended. Um, seniors are enjoying new freedom for their senior privilege and driving privileges, and um, they have already planned fundraisers uh, during the summer. Um, for school stuff, um, for like the newly built house three, people who are going there feel well adjusted and they feel like it's just like any other normal classroom, so that's going well. Um, there, some people's schedule has, people still feel some frustration with like having to travel between houses multiple times as it takes a lot of time and they have to carry their backpacks. This isn't an issue for all the students, but the scheduling is a problem still for some. And that's all. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, okay, item 3.01 is public comment. I believe we have two people here for public comment. Hold on a second. Get my list. Uh, Lee Pomeroy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lee Pomeroy. I am an alumnus of FM and the parent of three alumni, one of whom is a non-binary, transgender non-binary student. Our trans non-binary child transitioned in FM high school in 2015 and graduated in 2017. My husband, myself, and two of our children, including our non-binary child, are still in the community and call it home. Recent in recent public testimony here stated that, quote, there are only two genders and there is no such thing as trans child. No kid was born in the wrong body, end quote. I am here to emphatically say that trans, non-binary, and gender expansive children have always existed and have always been part of the FM community. It's just that today, the Dignity for All Student Act, or DASA, passed in 2015, and its implementation by the New York State Education Department ensures that our trans, non-binary, and gender expansive kids are hopefully welcome and safe from discrimination, bullying, and harassment in all public schools, including FM. I believe there is no leeway in recognizing the humanity of trans, non-binary, and gender expansive kids. As has been stated here many times before, FM must do a better job addressing the mental health of all its students, all its students, especially after our recent losses. Addressing mental health is suicide prevention. However, one cannot demand better mental health for students and, in the same breath, attack the existence validity and humanity of trans, non-binary, and gender expansive, non-conforming students. 
Not when 68% of students polled in 2021 felt unsafe at school due to their sexual orientation, gender identity, and or gender expression. I would like to recommend that the district consult the report entitled Schools in Transition, a Guide for Supporting Transgender Students in K-12 Schools, edited by the, right, the Human Rights Campaign, specifically the section entitled Key Elements and Practical Tips to ensure that we are employing the best practices when it comes to things like pronouns, personal safety, and school facilities. This document I emailed to you before the meeting. I hope you will consider auditing district practices based on this document. Please do not let outside forces, forces who have not lived LGBTQ plus experiences in the in, mm, and who do not believe in the humanity of my child, our children, drive your policy decisions. Our kids deserve more than this. I respectfully thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. And then Lauren Ruffage, please talk. Ruffage, sorry about that. Thank you for correcting me. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Ruffridge. Um, I'm the parent of three boys in the district. Excuse me, I'm a little nervous. Um, two of which are currently at Enders Road Elementary and I'm a volunteer with the Be Smart program which is what I'm here to talk about tonight. The issue of gun violence in schools has instilled fear in parents, educators, students, and leaders in our community. But we can take action together to help keep our schools safer. One important place to start is by practicing and encouraging secure gun storage in every home. A few facts about gun violence in schools. Unsecured firearms are often used in school gun violence. The US Secret Service found that three in four school shooters used a firearm that they took from a parent's or a close relative's home. Gun violence in schools includes not only mass shootings, homicides, and assaults, but also unintentional discharges, self-harm injuries, and suicide deaths using a firearm. Throughout the United States, an estimated 13 million households with children under the age of 18 contain at least one gun. And one study found that the majority of children in gun-owning households knew exactly where that gun was stored. Not all of these firearms are stored securely. Approximately 4.6 million children live in a household with at least one gun that is stored, loaded, and unlocked. According to the U.S. Secret Service, addressing student access to guns is a critical component of any school-based threat assessment intervention plan. And that starts with secure storage at home. <clears throat> the Be Smart program is a program of Everytown for Gun Safety Support Fund, and it was developed to reduce the deaths, injuries, and trauma that result when children gain access to unsecured firearms. The program emphasizes that secure storage is always the adult's responsibility. And it encourages include individuals to take five simple steps to keep kids and families safer. SMART is an acronym. The S stands for secure, secure guns in homes and in vehicles. M represents model. We are all to model responsible behavior around guns. A is to ask, ask about the presence of guns in other people's homes when your child is going for a play date. Um, or a sitter, babysitter is coming over. Recognize the role of guns in suicide, so R is recognize. And T is to tell your peers to be smart. One important thing that I want to note is that be smart is neutral on the topic of gun ownership. It does not encourage or discourage individuals from owning guns. It also does not advocate for changes to gun laws. Rather, it emphasizes the power of each and every adult to take agency over the safety of children and teens. Um, we've partnered with the manliest police department, we table with them and we have their support and we've been working together to try to bring this program to the community and we'd love your support and how we can bring it to the school district. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that was it for public comment, right Sarah? Or did, I just had one more person but I believe he, the, that person is not here, they are not here. All right, thank you. Um, 
All right, so we'll move on to new business, item 4.01, approval of the minutes from the July 31st special meeting, the August 14th regular meeting, August 21st special meeting, and the August 28th special meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Thank you, Cindy, and second from Sherry. Any discussion? I missed this at the beginning. Can we split these? We were just trying to save a little time. You want yeah, to stay in the one The only reason I'm saying split is there's, there's a whole series of people here, people not here for mm -hmm. those with all the sure. special meetings. Which, um, the special meetings? But the, everyone was here for the regular meetings, but not the special meetings. Is that what it was? Okay, we could just do these individually then. Um, all right, so motion to approve the minutes from the July 31st, 2023 special meeting. All those, is there a motion? Sorry. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Sherry. Any discussion of those minutes? All those in favor, indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Abstaining. Raise your hand. And wait, Chrissy, with your hand up for that one? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the min minutes from the regular meeting held on August 14th, 23? Thank you, Rebecca. Second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Those opposed? Those abstaining? One abstention? Any more? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the uh, minutes of the special meeting on August 21st? Thank you, Chrissy. Second from Sherry. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Okay, so if we raise your hands for her, you've got, who have we got? We've got, was that just, was that it from that meeting, Daryl and Rebecca? Okay. Um, all right, is there a motion to approve the minute, minutes from a special meeting held on August 28th? 2023. Thank you, Chrissy. And a second from Cindy. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Jason, Rebecca, and, yeah. and Cindy, was your hand up too? No. Okay. All right. Perfect. Moving on to item 4.02, approval of agreements with RMS. Is there a motion that there be resolved the Board of Education of the Fable Manly Central School District hereby approves of the district entering into agreements for the administration of student, parent, guardian, and st staff climate surveys in the amount of $22,725 in the 2023-24 school year? Is there a motion? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. <coughs> Item 4.03, app appointments. <coughs> Excuse me. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District make the following revised appointments as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Sarah. A second from Chrissy. Any discussion? <coughs> this is the procedural uh, changing of the guard, so to speak. All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. Item 4.04, designations. Is there a motion of the board of that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District make the following revised designations as presented? Is there a motion? Oh, thank you. Uh, Daryl and uh, Sherry, any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. <clears throat> Moving on to 4.05, reserve resolutions. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District approve the revised reserve resolution as follows? Thank you, Sarah, and a second from Cindy. Discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye, and no one's opposed or abstaining. <clears throat> Item 4.06, pardon? Just oh. The longest one I said. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> we're not gonna do all that. <laughs> That's okay. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby approves the retention of the Chase Construction for the 2023 capital transfer projects, authorizes the president of the board, the superintendent of schools, or their designee to enter into the contract on behalf of the Board of Education and take all actions necessary or convenient to proceed under contract in connection with the project. And upon board approval, this resolution shall take effect immediately. Is there a motion? Uh, thank you, Daryl. And 
Jason. <laughs> just like pick one. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye, and no one's opposed or abstaining. All right, under board development, <clears throat> are there anyone who's not going to be able to come September 18th to any part of that? We've got the facilities toured and we've got the dinner retreat part. Is everybody going to be there? Oh, that there is sense. a chance that I could be late. I don't think I will be, but I will just text and find out what building you're in at the time I can join at 4 p.m. No worries. Okay. All right, thank you so much. All right. Like, that's the part of the um, the, re the um, facilities tour part. Right. Then I'm going to do my best to get everyone done at, um, at <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. So I don't think we have anyone going to the, um, the NISBA convention. Okay. And then there's the other NISBA convention, um, April 6th through the 8th, let Sarah know if you rest it and the complimentary, complimentary web, webinar from the state controller. Right. Working agenda items. So we have on the <coughs> November 13th, the very important discussion about the tax exemptions and October 16th, the electric bus transition. October 16th is also when we're inviting our state our representatives to come, our legislative representatives, right? So Marissa, <coughs> um, Excuse me. Last year, we we were going to do some studying. Somebody, somebody was going to study the tax exemptions um, and have that data ready. Is is that going to be? You mean like? Um, oh, I I think you're referring to like the impact, like like how much it would impact different taxpayers, like different. I'm sorry, different homes based on their value. Like yeah, I think we were. We wanted to look at the whole, all the different categories and see what the impact would be. And I thought that was, if I'm, am I dreaming that? It, it was our, right, that was the takeaway from last year when we talked about it was that we needed to study it. And I know there was communication with John Deere about that as well, but I don't know what ha ended up happening with that. We will get the information. If you remember, it started when Mr. Furlong was here. We asked for it. A lot of the other municipalities went ahead and made their decisions. So they ended up not doing the study. So we're going to have to mine it and harvest it ourselves. So we will have that available. Yeah, but for the presentation, we're scheduled to present in the discussion, the hearing, and then to vote on it. Three consecutive meetings, correct? I'm not dreaming that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And we realize we've talked internally and we've talked as a governance team to make sure that we advertise that because I think the devil will be in the details on the numbers because I think our heart tells us one thing, then the hearing, the, our head will tell us something else as we kind of compare it and shift the tax burden. So I think it'll be important to hear all parties out on that. And then that certainly the following meeting will weigh into a vote on what we do regarding them so is the november 13th meeting the discussion or the vote just so we can yeah november 13th is the presentation discussion the hearing that's what I, that's my crib notes Our district clerk asked me if we could go back to 503. I know we've talked about calendars and school start times. As you saw today, the governor enacted Asian Lunar New Year. It will not affect us for the current school year, but will be a consideration in 2025 and years going forward.
the governor has made that a uh, holiday for all schools? Or? A state holiday. A state it falls holiday. on a Saturday for the current year, so it won't move unless it's a federal holiday like 4th of July. So, so but all state offices and schools will be closed on that it's day. It's a Saturday it this year, next year but next year in 2025. Okay. There's an article in today's paper. Alrighty. Um, so we did future Board of Ed meetings, some dates to remember coming up. Um, got the homecoming parade and game at the turf field. Um, if there are any board members interested in attending the, any of these events together, because we don't have many opportunities where we can go to events together, um, we can email about that and see we could sit together as a group with families, et cetera. Um, I think the homecoming one would be a good one. And um, even if we went to the um, Athletic Hall of Fame induction after that or the dessert concert. So um, I'll put that out there in email and see you know, if some of us could get together to do those things. That would be nice. Okay, then we add it 6.03. <laughs> That's your oath of office. <laughs> <clears throat> Please rise and raise your right hand to take your oath of allegiance. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the State of New York and the Constitution of the State of New York and that I will faithfully discharge and that I will faithfully discharge according to the best of my ability according to the best of my ability the duties of the office of ex officio board of education member the duties of the office of the ex officio board of education member of the Fayetteville Manlius Central School District of the Fayetteville Manlius Central School District congratulations Thank you.